Well, tonight we're very pleased to have Dr. Suzanne Traub-Metley back with us. She has been our featured June speaker for countless years. Ever. Forever. <laughs> Suzanne has done so many interesting jobs, but one of the constant things in her life is being here on the third Friday every June. And for that, I'm incredibly grateful. Thank you, Perfect. <laughs> She's one of our long-standing favorite speakers, and her background is it, that she has done things like be in Antarctica, picking up meteorites. She helped run Fisk Planetarium at the CU Boulder campus. She's worked for Secure World Foundation. She's taught, I forget how many thousands of students through Front Range Community college where she helped make astronomy one of the most popular courses on campus. So if you're from FRCC tonight, yeah! <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm the only one. I don't know, are there any front range community college students here? We oftentimes I, I'm an ex front range community I'm an ex. Very good. Thank but you. not at that campus. There we go. And currently she is teaching through Western Governors University. So, her title tonight, she's going to be talking about tides in and out and across the solar system. So, welcome, Suzanne. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is always so wonderful. This is really the highlight of my summer. And of course, tonight is summer solstice. So, thank you so much for spending the solstice with us tonight. And I want to let you know that I really do value all the volunteer work at LTO. For those of you who are brand new, you don't realize how many hours of diligent work and patience and sweat have gone into this. For instance, the 24-inch telescope, which sadly is not working tonight, might I have to drive from Los Angeles, right? Was it Los Angeles? It was California. Pasadena. Yeah, so, I mean, Everything here is hand-built, hand-done, and it's done with love. So I really appreciate your spending some of your time tonight to share that love and that appreciation of what this community can do when it comes together. So how about a hand for all the LTO being interrupted, especially by young people. So if you have a question, you can raise your hand or you can just shout out, I'm good. I'll stop what I'm talking about and talk to you. And that, of course, applies to children of all ages. <laughs> so what we're going to do tonight is um, uh, talk about tides in and out of the solar system. Because one of the wonderful things, oh, it would help if I had my pointer so I could actually change slides. Hey, technology. So, um, one of the great things, oh yes, my Don't forget to turn it on. Yeah, details. Good for you. <laughs> See, and this is why we rely on the volunteer expertise of LTO staff. Uh, so, the wonderful thing about tides is that they're pretty. They're just beautiful. And tides are everywhere. So, what you'll find is that you are exerting a tidal influence right now. I bet you didn't know that. Because tides are all about mass. It's all about how many atoms are in your body and what sort of gravitational force they exert. So the person sitting next to you is experiencing some gravitational interaction from you. And of course, you're feeling it from the person sitting next to you. Those of you at the end of the row, you're feeling it all on one side, your left side. But if you're in the middle, your gravitational forces are all balanced. Isn't that cool? Thank you, Isaac Newton. So, I'm not going to get into the math, because you know it's on the screen, I don't have to get into it. The whole point is that the bigger the body, in terms of more mass, the more massive the body, the more the gravitational pull. But the further away the bodies are from each other, the less the gravitational pull. In a way that drops off so fast, that's called the inverse square law. 
So that's Newton's law of universal gravitation. And the thing about law when we say in science, it's really a guiding principle. You need these guiding principles to build theories, which are the really important part. So Newton's laws can be violated by things like Einstein's theory of special relativity and general relativity. The theories are the important guides, not the laws. But Newton did a lot of good work, and it explains exactly what we need to talk about what's happening when we have something like the Earth and the Moon influencing each other. We know that Earth is the big guy. It's sort of the orange ball that we have here. And so Earth's gravity, since it's the most massive body, dominates. And it pulls on the Moon, and the Moon actually experiences little earthquakes. Except it's not Earth, it's the Moon. So we call them moonquakes. But the Moon exerts a force on Earth. Now, how many of you have heard that Sunday is a super moon? Yeah! What does that mean? It means nothing in particular. Yeah. <laughs> because all objects that orbit nearly every other object have elliptical orbits rather than perfectly circular orbits. What elliptical means is that sometimes they're a little closer and sometimes they're a little further away. But it's okay, that's supposed to happen. And just like you have a birthday every year, every year there's going to be a day when the moon is at perigee, it's at its closest point, and the moon is at apogee, it's at its furthest point. That's totally normal. Can you see the difference between perigee and apogee with your own eyes? No. <laughs> no, not at all. So go look at a magazine article or a newspaper article where somebody has published a picture of perigee and apogee. And you'll see that, oh, it's like this much different. So they're going to make a big deal about it on the internet. It's no big deal. Is it going to mean the moon is close enough to cause earthquakes? No. The last time we had a perigee, it just, well, not last year, the year before, was March 2011 when the Japan earthquake and tsunami occurred. And everyone said, oh, it was the super moon. No, it wasn't. The days were off. It didn't work. And even if the moon was close, I mean really close, it's not enough to cause an earthquake and tsunami of that magnitude. So there are gravitational forces that affect the Earth and the moon and the sun. And we'll talk about that. But no, no earthquakes on Sunday. Let's put it this way. There may be earthquakes. They have nothing to do with the moon. Questions or comments before I go on? Then I'll go on. <laughs> All right, so what is a tide? A tide is an unequal movement of particles, meaning the really light stuff moves a lot, and the really heavy stuff <laughs> doesn't. OK, get used to that. I have no grace whatsoever. Uh, lighter stuff move more. <laughs> there you go. It was a deliberate. There you go. Thank you, Andrea. So yeah, lighter stuff moves a lot. And by lighter stuff, we're talking about air. The air you breathe, you don't know it. We're not talking wind, like going from over the Rocky Mountains on, onto the plains. That's the jet stream. That's controlled by the Coriolis effect. That's a totally different process. But we also have vertical movement of air, where the air actually rises up away from planet Earth. And sometimes that air descends a little bit. Well, when we have a tide, when the moon and the sun exert their gravitational influence, the air moves. And so does the land, the land that you stand on. You don't even know it, but there are these giant waves rolling under your feet. And you're going up with the land as it goes. But it's such a broad, gentle swell. You don't feel a thing. You may go up two inches and down two inches over the course of two hours. You won't notice. But it happens. And we can measure it. And we do. But we see the water move. 
Now, we live in Colorado, which is as landlocked as you can get. And we don't even have a big lake. But if you lived in a place with a big lake or with rivers or near the ocean, you'd really see that water move. And so you'd see high tide and low tide. These pictures are of the exact same place in Spain. And you can see that at one point it's totally underwater. And at the other point, it's not. That's the difference between high tide, where the water sloshes into one place, and low tide, where the water sloshes away. And of course, if you live in an area with that kind of water, then it's really noticeable. And you plan your life around that. Can I go collect seashells or oysters for dinner tonight? If it's low tide, yes. I want to go out onto the top of flat and get food to eat. On the other hand, if I'm trying to launch a ship, I want high tide. I want as much water as possible so my really heavy cargo ship will have all that water to float in and I can shove it away from shore more easily. So yes, if you live in an area full of water, this is important. We live in Colorado. What do we know? We know that actually you don't get a high tide or a low tide once every 12 hours. You think, well, wait a minute. Earth takes 24 hours, almost, to go once around its spin axis. So every 12 hours, which is half a day, should give us a very different circumstance than every other 12 hours. But we forget that the moon, as it goes around Earth, couldn't care less about how Earth is rotating. The moon is orbiting in its own pattern that's not related. So if you were going to look at where the moon is from day to day, let's say you wanted to look from when the moon was at its highest point overhead to when the moon was at its next highest point overhead, the moon has moved. So for instance, do, do I have a young person who can be a volunteer? Can somebody come up, please? All right, come on up. I would love that. Thank you very much. OK, so I want you to be the moon. What is your name, please? Colton. Colton. Colton is the moon. I'm the Earth, because I'm the more massive object. By a lot. All right, Colton. So I'm going to be the Earth. I'm going to do a day-night cycle. Who wants to be the sun? You can stay in your seat, but I need you to be the sun. Who's going to be the sun? All right, thank you. And your name is? Caleb. Caleb, that's right, we talked earlier. Caleb and Colton, excellent. So Caleb is the sun, Colton is the moon. If I look at you, it's daytime. And if I look away from you, then from my point of view, it's nighttime. Which is interesting, because sometimes I can see the moon at night, and sometimes I see it during the day. What I'd like you to do, Colton, is while I'm spinning around my rotation axis, can you move? Yeah. All right, thank you. Now remember, as the moon goes around Earth, I'm Earth, so you have to go around me in a circle. You always have to keep your face to me. I don't have to look at you, but you have to look at me, okay? All right, you guys ready? All right, so I'm looking at the sun. It's noon, and let's both move this way. Good, go. So now it's nighttime. I can't see the sun. I can see the sun. Excellent. Oh, the moon has moved. And so it takes more than 12 hours for me to see the moon again and to feel the moon's gravitational effect on me because it's in a different place than it was before, right? Questions? Round of applause for our moon. I can't try 
ever do that, I'll fall over. <laughs> but what's interesting is, as Earth spins, some of the water and the air can't, can't go as fast. Because there are mountains in the way. There are ocean bases. There are things that hold the water in place. And, you know, just like basic gravity will hold stuff in place. And so you end up with stuff on the other side of Earth. And you end up with two tidal bulges. One wherever the moon is-ish, and one on the exact opposite side of Earth. So because Earth moves, we get two tidal bulges. Does anyone have a question there? So, let's talk about forces. Here's your physics for tonight. No math, we already did the math. Has anybody washed a washing machine? Have you ever washed it, wash your clothing? Watched it, wash your clothing. Okay. It's really neat because especially when it spins really fast to get all the water out, right? You've gone through the wash cycle with all the soap, then you put the water in for the rinse cycle, and then you get that wonderful spin dry so that your jeans are not this soggy mass of whatever, but all of that water gets out of the jeans and out of the towels and all that, and you can put it in the dryer, and the dryer doesn't have to go, oh, what a soggy mess. No, by the time you put it in the dryer, your clothes are actually, well, pretty dry. And that's because the washer has this drum that rotates really fast. And when it rotates really fast, you get something called a centrifugal force. But I like to say centrifugal, because it's like a centrifuge, which is like one of those rides in the amusement park where you get backed up against the wall and the floor drops up, but you're still held, you're pressed against the wall. You guys know what I'm talking about? When you spin really fast, there's this force that shoves you against the wall, and it shoves the water out of the washing machine. And the only reason you don't go flying out of the washing machine is the drum of the washing machine holds you in place, or the wall of that amusement park ride holds you in place. Otherwise, you go flying. So that centrifugal force goes opposite the force of gravity. And the faster you spin, the more of a centrifugal centrifuge-like force you get. So depending where you are on Earth, sometimes the force of gravity, which is the blue line, see these blue arrows? Sometimes they dominate. But sometimes, depending where you are, those gold centrifugal centrifuge-like forces dominate. And then you end up with this thick purple line, which puts the two together with a whole lot of math and physics we're not going to get into. And that determines how the water moves. So you can see these purple lines point this way toward the moon, but also point that way away from the moon that? So, tidal forces and these tidal bulges result in a balance between the centrifugal force and the gravitational force, and you get two tidal bulges, which is really what we see. Has anyone lived in an area with a tide? Have you seen the, the water slosh in and slosh out? Can you tell me about it? Where were you? California. And were you like in Port Wienemi or someplace? Where were you? Vandenberg. Vandenberg! Oh, I'm so impressed. Vandenberg Air Force Base. Thank you, sir, for your service. Excellent. And is it pretty obvious when the tide comes in and goes out? And I saw a hand back here. Was it, was it you, Mark? Yeah, East Coast. East Coast? Where? Jersey. Jersey. Okay, remember Hurricane Sandy, New York and New Jersey really got hit with that tidal surge because the storm, and it really was two storms coming together to form one superstorm, happened to also come on a full moon. So enormous tidal forces combined with the atmospheric disturbance. That, that's why it was such a disaster. And where were you, Mark? I did various places, but I mean, on the seaside. 
Right. Right. So for those of you who've never set foot out of Colorado, this really is a big leaping deal. So let's talk about the sun. And you're like, wait a minute. Only the moon controls tides. No. The sun contributes 40% of the gravitational influence that affects tidal activity. If we ever lost our moon, which we're not going to do, but if we ever did, would we still have tides? Yes, because we still have the sun. And 40% is a lot. So 40% is due to the sun, 60% is due to the moon. That adds up to 100%. That's a big tidal effect. And it all has to do with moon phase. Does anybody know what is a moon phase? The light on the moon. Yes. It's light from the sun. Half of the moon is always lit. Always. But from our point of view on Earth, we see only a certain percentage of that sunlit side of the moon. Sometimes we don't see any, and that's what we call a new moon. Sometimes we see 25%. That's what we call it a first quarter moon. Sometimes we see all of that, we call that a full moon. And of course, there are waning and, and waxing and crescent and gibbous phases. Moon phases are all another talk. It's really cool. But it's how much of the sunlit side of the moon can we see? And it turns out that has everything to do with tides. Because the spring tide has nothing to do with the season of spring. Really, it's all about having an extra spring in its step, right? If it jumps up with that water and air and land, really respond to that gravitational pull of not only the moon, but the moon and the sun together, then you get an extra high tide. And you get that whenever the sun and the moon are in a straight line that like we have at the top here. So maybe the moon and the sun are on the same side of Earth. That's absolutely the highest high tide. But you can also get it when the sun and the moon are opposite each other. So remember that tidal bulge is on both sides. And you can get a spring tide that way. So you don't get a spring tide in the season of spring only. You get it twice a month, whenever there's a new moon and whenever there's a full moon. Conversely, you get a neap tide, which is still a high tide. It's just the lowest high tide. Because now you're making an L shape between the quarter moon, in this case the third quarter moon, and the sun, or between the sun, the earth, and the first quarter moon. You're still making an L that's sideways. And whenever you make that L shape, then the water doesn't know which way to go. It's still being really influenced by the sun and the moon, but it's confused. Do I go here? Do I go there? So the water tries to make everybody happy? Yeah, not so much. So it's the lowest high tide, but it's still a high tide. You still have a lot of sloshing back and forth. Questions there? Has anyone heard a neap tide before? Yeah, it's a really weird old word. Have you heard about it? Where, where did you learn about it? Part of the Navy. <laughs> yes, and the U.S. Naval Observatory really still monitors this quite a bit. The U.S. Navy cares a great deal when you have spring tide and when you have neap tide. And here's the interesting thing. Because of the physics involved, it's not a straight line. If I, oh, I have a laser pointer. Let's see if I can be smart enough to use the laser pointer. There we go. If I was drawing a straight line from the Earth to the moon, OK, sort of a straight line. Let's try that again. OK, sort of a straight line. Don't you think the bulge would be here? But it's not. The bulge is actually over here. It's making this other angle. It's about 10 to 15 degrees ahead of where the moon is. That's weird. It is weird. There's a lot of really horrible, complicated math I promise not to get into. But this is why. Because we're not talking about a billiard ball 
We're not talking about a perfect surface with a perfect ocean and a perfect atmosphere. Earth is a wonderful place. It looks like me. It's all lumpy and bumpy. It's got mass concentrations in places I don't necessarily want them, right? So, whoops, I went way too far. Sorry. All right, go back, go back, go back. Sorry. Okay, so you've seen the whole talk. Yay. <laughs> so, all here, this is from the European Space Agency. And this came out a couple of years ago. The red is sort of average. The blue means there, there's not very much gravitational pull, but the yellow at the top there, like right around Europe, that's where there's a whole lot of gravitational pull. This is where Earth is lumpy and bumpy. And as the water in the air try to slosh around mountains and ocean basins, um, it gets hot. You can't respond very well. And because we have a complex system, well, we have a complex situation. And so the water actually moves ahead of that straight line per moon distance. So what do we care? Why is this important to us? Because Earth actually gives energy to the moon. And it's been doing this ever since the moon formed more than 4 billion years ago. This has been going on for a long time. And we know from the rock record and from looking at fossils that tides a long time ago were much stronger than they are today. And we know from looking at things like coral that have a certain amount of shell material made every day that the length of the day actually changed. So Earth's spin rate was much faster. A billion years ago, we had like a 22 hour a day. A billion years from now, we will have more hours in the day. We'll have a good 26 hour day or it's not going to do you any good. But, <laughs> There will be more hours in the day. And Earth has been moving further away from Earth every year. And this is called tidal recession. Recession because the moon recedes. It moves back away from Earth. How do we know this? Hey, remember there were some guys who walked on the moon a few years ago, 1969 and 19... Through 1972, the Apollo Moon Program, those Apollo astronauts left mirrors on the moon as part of what was called the Lunar Laser Ranging Program. Where did the lasers come from? They're still coming from places like McDonald Observatory in Texas. And periodically, McDonald Observatory or someplace in China or someplace in Iran, whoever needs to do the lunar ranging work, and it's global, it's not political, they'll shoot a laser beam toward those mirrors on the moon and they'll calculate how long it takes to get to the mirrors and how long it takes to come back. And sure enough, we've been able to measure the moon is moving away at about the same rate as the continents are moving apart, at about the same rate your hair grows or your fingernails grow. That's about two to three inches every year. Is that wild? You don't notice it. You don't feel it. You don't feel your fingernails grow. You don't feel the moon moving away. But it is. And Earth has been slowing down too. You don't notice that either. The moon will not leave. All the moon is trying to do is get into a dynamically stable relationship with Earth. Meaning, it's having too intense a relationship and needs to back off and find a good steady state. Still working on it. And remember, if the moon is moving away from Earth, Earth is also moving away from the moon and slowing down its rate. The Earth and the moon are having a marriage where they're still trying to work things out. And it's going to be fine. They're going to stay together, but a little further and a little slower than right now. Yes? Is Earth moving away from the sun? No. Um, let's put it this way. The Earth is in a really stable orbital slot. When you look at how gravity works, there's something called a gravity well. And Earth is really nice in the 
bottom of its own gravity well in its orbit around Earth. It's like a groove in a record, for those of you old enough to remember records with grooves that you put needles in. And those, those grooves are at certain places. Um, with orbits, can things migrate? Sure. Early in solar system history, there was a lot of movement. Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, they were much closer to the sun four billion, four and a half billion years ago than now. But about 600 million years after the solar system formed, and we had sort of a great migration. Those big Jovian planets migrated outward away from the sun to their current locations. Was there a lot of jostling for position among the smaller guys? Yes. Uh, what's the evidence? We look at things like impact basins on Earth's moon. And we see that there's this big spike in things hitting other things about 600 million years after we think the solar system formed. So right there on the rock record is this proof that stuff moves and stuff goes flying around. And if the big guys move, the little guys scatter out of the way. And the solar system is still trying to settle down from that. This is why we have asteroids and comets acting like drivers on I-25 who don't always stay in their lane. Right? Accidents still occur. Things still collide. Um, but it's a whole lot less than it was early in the solar system. So, do we live in a completely safe environment? No. But it's much more mature and stately and gentle than it was a long time ago. And part of that are these objects sort of figuring out where they want to be with respect to each other. Earth figured out where it wants to be with respect to the sun quite a while ago. But, lots of other objects are still figuring this out too. And this is why we talk about tidal flexing. When we get to other parts of the solar system, not just Earth, we see that these tidal forces really affect places like Io, the moon, the big moon closest to Jupiter. There are other moons close to Jupiter, but Io is special. For one thing, it's yellow. That's the real color. And in fact, when I was in grad school, we called it the pizza planet. Because it's got the yellow for the cheese, and red for the marinara sauce, and pepperoni and stuff. Um, what's really amazing is that, I mean, Earth has volcanoes, but Io has more volcanoes than Earth. Earth is nothing compared to the volcanic activity of Io. Io is constantly erupting. Why? Because it's got Jupiter on one side and all the other moons of Jupiter, pretty much, on the other. And those gravitational stresses, it doesn't know if it's going to go this way or that way. And it's cracking apart in a very deliberate pattern. You can actually see, you can predict where that next volcano is going to erupt, where that crust is going to crack, because you know about time. There's something called a Roche limit, named for Edward Roche, who lived more than 100 years ago in France and predicted, hey, I wonder if I get too close to some place. Will the tidal forces be so big that I completely break apart? Yes. What proof do we have? There are these four moons of Jupiter that are even closer in than Io. And you know what's happening to these poor guys? They are literally being ground into dust because of the tidal forces between Jupiter and all the other moons. And they are literally falling apart and making Jupiter's gossamer rings. Those super thin, very dark, dusty rings around Jupiter. Has anyone heard of the gossamer rings of Jupiter? You have to be a certain age. It was a big deal when the Voyager spacecraft first discovered this in the 70s and 80s. Not so much now. What's now interesting? Well, about five, six years ago, one of the moons of Saturn, Enceladus, was found to have active geysers of water. And this water has salt in it. This is water in contact with rock, which means mud, which means microbes might potentially live in that mud. Yeah. Good stuff. You want to look for life? Mars is nice. Enceladus is much more interesting. 
And you get these amazing structures in the rings of Saturn. Enceladus actually provides ice for the E ring. The F ring is held together by what are called shepherd moons. Who remembers in the early 90s, Enya had a little album called Shepherd Moons? Yeah, she didn't know her science. But this is what she was talking about, where you have two moons, in this case, Pandora and Prometheus, and I'm not sure which one's which. I think this is Pandora and this is Prometheus. And not only do they keep the rings together, but Prometheus especially, look at this innermost ring. It's got some little areas that are disturbed. And in fact, if you do a real close-up, you can see it looks like that introduction to James Bond, right, with the, the inside of the barrel of the gun, and James Bond's walking through looking real cool. Yeah, well, that's Prometheus. Whoops, that was Prometheus right there looking very cool. And when we look at the asteroid belt in between Mars and Jupiter, we see the same sort of thing. There are certain places where it's really safe and good to have a whole lot of objects, and certain places where it's not. And here you can have a bunch, and here you can't. You know what it's like in a classroom? If we don't have it here. But sometimes in a classroom, there's a center aisle where nobody sits. And everyone keeps their textbooks and their book bags out of the way. Why? Because I'm walking back and forth, because I'm the instructor. And so everybody keeps everything under their feet or under their chairs, because they know the big guy's coming through. Well, we don't have it here tonight, but we sort of do. We have an aisle over there where you can walk, and an aisle over there where you can walk. And you are sitting so nicely up here on the counter and not in here, so if I want to walk back and forth, I can. So this is not a good place for you to sit, but this is, and this is, and this is, and that is, and that is, but not here. So this happens naturally because of these gravitational interactions. For the asteroid belt, it's because the Sun and Jupiter tell smaller objects. You can be here, you cannot be here. When you're beyond Neptune, then it's other objects very far from the sun. I don't know if you guys have heard about what's past Neptune. There's a place called the Kuiper Belt, sometimes pronounced Kuiper Belt. And then there's the Oort Cloud. These are full of little guys, like comets and asteroids and dwarf planets like Pluto. And sure enough, Pluto and Neptune have this really, whoops, I keep doing that, have this really interesting relationship where Pluto and its five moons um, never, ever, ever collide with Neptune, even though Pluto sometimes is closer to the sun than Neptune is, because they've got this orbital resonance relationship. They've got this time-sharing thing worked out, where they can be in the same place, but never at the same time, so they'll never collide. Does it take a while to develop that kind of relationship? Oh, yeah. Again, it's like when you first get together with somebody and, and you end up trying to both be in the bathroom at the same time, that doesn't work. And then you figure out a nice schedule where okay, you get the bathroom first always. And so we'll never ever have a collision. Okay, so this is what happens in the outer solar system past Neptune. Because there's so many objects in the Kuiper Belt and the Oort Cloud that their combined mass is enough to exert a gravitational influence to keep things pretty neat and orderly. And so these bodies align so that they don't run into each other most of the time. And that actually determines what's where in the solar system. And it's so cool, because when you look, look at these numbers. From the sun to Earth is one astronomical unit. That's 93 million miles, or about 150 kilometers. That's what we define as one astronomical unit. Jupiter is at 5, Saturn is at 10, Uranus is at 20, and Neptune is at 30, and then Pluto averages around 40 because it's really somewhere between 30 and 50, but the entire Kuiper belt is right around here. These are nice numbers, and it's not an accident. 
the physics and the math always works out to nice, simple relationships because of the physics of gravitational interplay, these gravitational interactions to give you a nice, orderly, mature solar system. This does develop over time. When we look at other solar systems, and thanks to the Kepler mission, we've looked at several hundred, we see different solar systems and different levels of maturity. And as you can imagine, the immature stuff has a whole lot more activity. And the really mature ones, they're even more organized and less dynamic than ours. So where you are in the solar system really has everything to do with where everything else is in the solar system and how you respect each other's personal boundaries. Any questions or comments here? Yeah, how did uh, Jupiter and Saturn in the middle instead of Jupiter and Saturn going to the end? Oh, well, what happened, well, first off, it's really funny. Most of us are accustomed to seeing the sun on the left, and doesn't it freak you out to see the sun on the right? Right? We get so accustomed to certain visualizations, you have to remember, oh, we made that up. It's like when you look at a map of Earth, we always have North America right in the middle. Except what if you live in Australia? Have you ever looked at a map of Australia from the Australians? Australians in the middle and at the top. Right, so maps are wherever we make them, and this is just a map. So in this case, we happen to have the sun on the right. And as I said, Jupiter and Saturn, those were probably the first planets to really form. And they formed much closer to the sun, pretty much between where Earth and Mars are now. And then they migrated outward. And as they migrated outward, they found the spots that gravitationally worked best for them. Just like when you came into the room tonight, you found the right chair for you. Some of you like being in the back. Some of you like being in the front. Some of you like being on the side. Some of you don't mind being in the middle or sitting on the counter. You found the spot that worked for you, and then you sat there. You've been sitting there for a while now. Good for you. Thank you for your patience. But you're exhibiting the same sort of behavior that the planets do. You find the right spot for you, and then you stay there. However, if I came up to you and I said, please, would you come down and help me with something? Wouldn't you come down? Yeah, you would. So gravitationally, if Jupiter said to objects in the asteroid belt, hey, move, um, the little ones will move. The big ones, not so much. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Okay, great. Others? So, of course, we get to go beyond our solar system. We get to go into entire galaxies. Remember, a galaxy is a city of stars. Every solar system has one, two, or three stars, and the very center is the center of mass of that system. And you get all the little guys. All the planets, the dwarf planets, the moons, comets, asteroids, whatever else you have in the solar system, rain particles, whatever. All of that orbits one, two, or three stars. And a galaxy has at least 100 billion stars with all those planets and things around every single star or star system. That's a lot of stuff. So when we talk about galaxies, we're talking a lot of mass. And therefore, even though they're really far away from each other, galactic tides exert an enormous influence. Caleb, okay, how many galaxies are Our best estimate, and this is just an estimate, is there are at least 100 billion galaxies in our universe, and it might be more than one universe. So, one star per solar system minimum, 100 billion stars per galaxy on average. We're not talking dwarf galaxies, we're talking normal galaxies. And then at least 100 billion galaxies in a universe, and there might be more than one universe. Yeah, it's a lot of stuff. Thank you. Excellent question. How many planets circle their stars from what we can tell, in terms of what's really close to the star, from what we can tell from the Kepler mission and others, there's the European Space Agency Corot mission as well, um, 
there's a lot of planet-like material. In fact, let's, let's just look at our own solar system. We've got eight big planets, about 50 dwarf planets, uh, about 150 moons, and about a million little guys. We're talking comets, asteroids, ring particles. It might be more than that. Let's just say one million to keep the math easy. One million objects per star. 100 billion stars per galaxy, 100 billion galaxies per universe, and these we know are low numbers. That's a lot of stuff. That's just a lot of stuff. How much of it is as close to the star as Earth? We're still trying to figure that out, but probably a lot. When the early planet hunting missions were going in the mid-1990s, the early 2000s, we were like, oh, maybe there are a few hundred exoplanets, you know, planets orbiting stars other than Earth. Now we know there are thousands, now tens of thousands, probably. We've only identified a few thousand and then the Kepler mission crapped out, so, oh well. But we have all that data to get through. So, what's that? I'm sorry, I heard a question. The Kepler mission? Yeah, and the Corot mission with the Europeans, that's still going on. So we're still getting the data, we're still crunching the numbers, it'll take years. Um, but, so to answer your question, I don't know, but there's a lot of stuff close enough to be an Earth-sized object at an Earth-Sun distance equivalent to one AU. So, a lot. What suggests multiple universes? What suggests multiple universes is the fact that the physics and the math for our own universe don't add up. For instance, gravity. We really don't understand gravity. Newton described it 300 years ago. We don't understand gravity. We don't understand about gravitational waves. We don't understand exactly why this force is this much, but not more, or not less. And if you have other universes, that might be a good way of explaining some of the things we don't understand about gravity. That, and there seems to be some observational evidence that there's more, as, as Shakespeare said, there's more in heaven and earth ratio than dreamt of in your philosophy, and we're starting to get some evidence of that. So people like Lisa Randall at Harvard are really at the forefront, cutting edge of this multiple universe idea, and I don't understand her, my eyes glaze over. But I know it's there, and it's a possibility. Yes? Fred Davies gives an analysis probability of permutation of a vector of 15 cards, and how you get a range of them, and then some another. He says after that, it's got to repeat. If you do that with all the parts of the universe, there's a problem with the universe. That's his argument. Yeah, patterns do repeat. Nature loves to recycle. It recycles <coughs> elements, it recycles patterns, and it recycles numbers. And there's no reason why the universe should live up to its name of being all inclusive and everything all in one. It is possible to have more than one. But now we're getting into the intersection of philosophy and physics and astronomy, and I get a headache. So what I wanted to get into here is that if you do supercomputer models, and this one was done a few years ago at Stanford University, if you put an average galaxy into your computer model, and that means you have a whole lot of dust and gas, you have a halo of dark matter. Why is it dark? Because we can't detect it. Do we understand it? No. Do we know it's there? Yes. How do we know it's there? Because if I took the back of your shirt and I yanked, wouldn't you move? You see, I'm not touching you. <laughs> but if I did, you right? So dark matter is like that. Something's yanking on you, but you can't see it. It's behind you. You don't know what it is. There you go. Right, exactly. Exactly. So we can see how things behave and respond to, tar to dark matter. But we can't see the dark matter itself. And there's also something called dark energy, which I won't get into. That we, again, we see the behavior, but we cannot see what really creates it. So when you put all of this into a supercomputer model with a supermassive black hole at the center of every galaxy, you get these kinds of patterns. And you see the tides form structures. 
And then you look at real life, oh my gosh, it's the same stuff. So what we theorized and put into a computer model, we have in real life. So the model is on the right track. Does it have all the answers? No. Are we getting there? We're getting closer. We know that tides, these gravitational interactions between massive bodies in each galaxy can act as one massive body because they're far enough away from each other. We know that we get these beautiful images of these actual objects. These are all real pictures. They're not photoshopped. This is actual, a lot of telescopes. And you can see them, hopefully tonight, if the weather holds. And if not, the next time you come and the 24 inches of me, you can actually see these gorgeous images, like the M51 Whirlpool Galaxy interacting with another galaxy. You know that this is actual. And it's all because of tides. Thank you.
what's going on with the planetary objects around it, what are the environments, and all of that factors into whether this is going to be a place where we can recognize the light, or it's there and we just can't see it. You know, one of the things about the moons of Pluto, remember earlier I said there are five moons of Pluto now? These are not new, but we only just discovered them. They've been there all along. So a lot of it is from our perspective, what do we perceive, as opposed to what's actually been there. So is there life elsewhere in the cosmos? Probably, but we haven't seen it yet. So as far as we're concerned, the answer's no. But that's a tentative. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. Maita, did you want to say anything at this point? Well, the only thing I want to say is that it's fairly cloudy out there, so it's still very light, so we probably won't be able to see anything. And last night we had a problem with the 24 inch, so the power supply is not working, so the 24 inch is out, so the only telescopes available tonight are the 18 inch and the 6 inch. But like I said, it's probably 90% of clouds. And a few little holes in there. The moon is not even showing yet. Well, I'm happy to stay and talk for as long as you want, but you should feel free to get up, move around, look through the telescopes, go outside, do what you like tonight. Thank you so much. Happy solstice and have a wonderful day.